Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with part two of our ongoing series of the Neville Mariner recordings on Capriccio. Now, you may recall, in our last episode, we dealt with the London recordings, and I pointed out that these were made after his scarf period. That's the time at which conductors think that there's such hot shit that they wear a scarf, or if you're James Levine, a towel, or, you know, something that just makes you look oh so distinguished, and which indicates that you're about to do something that you probably have no business doing, or at least that was the case with Neville Mariner. And so, in honor of this propensity amongst conductors to adopt the scarf when they think that they are infallible interpretively and artistically invincible and an absolute, an absolute, the, the, the very essence, the acme of Western musical culture, yeah, right, I am now going to be dress appropriately so that we may do the scarf period for whichever conductor we're dealing with, because they all go through it as they get older and become more and more self-absorbed and narcissistic and insufferable. And, you know, this you'll have to see. There you go. Okay. So we are talking about Neville Mariner in his scarf period. And in this case, for the scarf period, we are dealing with the Stuttgart recordings. Now, these are the recordings he made after he had left Minnesota and thought he was actually an appropriate conductor for a real symphony orchestra. And he was in Stuttgart for only about three or four years total as actual music director of the, the Stuttgart Radio Symphony Orchestra. It was about from 19, I think it was like 84 to, to 87 or 86 to 89 or somewhere in there. And he made this box which contains 15 CDs of mostly abysmal recordings. Now, this one, the London period, had some stuff that he really did very well. First of all, he was with the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields, his own ensemble, and there was a good bit of Baroque music in here and stuff that he was otherwise pretty good at. So that was, that was always a good thing. Here... No such luck. Here, the the standard of quality is almost, but not quite, uniformly dismal. And we're going to go through all 15 discs, one atrocity at a time. So let's take it out. And I am ready to do the scarf period. All right. It begins with a program of Beethoven overtures. These are not so terrible. They're not exciting, of course, because it's Mariner and his Beethoven cycle was probably the dullest thing anyone ever did. The one on Phillips, remember that? Oh boy. And, but no, here you get Fidelio, Coriolan, uh, the Ruins of Athens, King Stephan, Naaman's Fire, The Consecration of the House, and Leonora Number 1. Notice he leaves out, except for Coriolan, which is kind of exciting, the really big ones, Leonora Number 3, Egmont, the ones that require really lots of oomph. Of course, The Consecration of the House requires that too, but these are decent, clean, classical, not hugely exciting Beethoven performances. So that's okay. But disc two, oh, look, Beethoven, Leonora, Overture number two, Egmont. Oh, no. Oh, no. The Creatures of Prometheus, his ballet music, this ballet music from, 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 what's the ballet music from here? Oh, the Creatures of Prometheus, some of the ballet music. And then finally, Leonora number three. No, 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 no. No, no, Mr. Mariner. This is not the stuff he should be doing. He just doesn't have the juice in him. Then we get his Schumann Symphony Cycle, and you get the four basic standard symphonies. Then you get a couple movements of the Zwickauer Symphony, and the Manfred Overture, and then the Overture Scherzo and Finale. Now, these Schumann performances are, are it's like so much here. When he gets into romantic music, it's okay, it's decently played, but if you think Schumann was a hot-blooded, 
romantic visionary. You are not going to hear that in these performances. They have none of the impulse, the energy, the excitement that you hear in performances by people as different as Savalish or Bernstein or Zell or Muti or Schulte or Dohnani or, or I mean, I could go on and on and on. This is Mariner, neat, tidy Mariner, who really has no business doing this music. Okay, next. Oh, God. Mahler 4. Oh, my God. This is really, really dire. This is Mahler 4. I mean, you, he's doing Mahler 4 because it's Mahler's most neoclassical symphony, right? It's the one that Mariner should be able to do because he could pretend he's doing classical music. That's bull. Mahler isn't ever really like that. He's not. You need to still have the spookiness in the scherzo, that serenity and passion and and the, just the color and intensity in the slow movement. Just, just forget it. I mean, oh God, it's horrible. Then he does two discs of Richard Strauss. I mean, Richard Strauss, why? Don Juan, Capriccio, and the Rosen Cavalier Suite. The Don Juan, again, it's okay, but it has no sex. How can you have a sexless Don Juan? It's impossible. Possible, at least it was, until this performance came along. The other two things, the Capriccio is faux, faux neoclassicism, sextetish thing, right? And the Rosen Cavalier Suite, you know, conducts itself. You just you just go, okay, guys, three, four, go, waltz, have fun. And they do it, and that's the end of it. Then there's another disc, Till Oil and Spiegel's Merry Pranks and Metamorphosen. I actually like this Metamorphosen because it's only 24 minutes long, which means it's on the fast side and we get through it. But the Till Oil and Spiegel, again, it has no character, no personality. And then, oh, wow, Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony with the vocalese as a coupling. Now, not only is this the most passionless Rachmaninoff Second Symphony that you have ever heard in your life, but it has all of the traditional cuts. It is cut. What is the point? This is in the mid-1980s he's making these recordings. By then, we had not been doing this music with cuts. Not at all. Certainly not recording it that way. Why would he do that? What could be more absolutely uncompetitively pointless? This is so bad, it's a scarf isn't enough. It gets it gets a wrap. Hold it. This is the Rachmaninoff too. It gets the it gets the wrap around the scarf. There. There. That's Rachmaninoff too. That's how horrible it is. It's not even it's not even one scarf worth. It's a wraparound worth. And then it's okay. So let's finish that. We have Rachman ah after Rachmaninoff. Bar talk. All right. He does the music for strings, percussion, and celesta. That's a good piece for him because it's a piece that's basically structural. And he did a fantastic recording of it with the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. This one is very, very similar, but comparatively lacking in tension compared to his first one. All the tempos are the same, but the, the orchestra is not the same. The ensemble isn't the same. He can't make up for in, in clarity and precision what he lacks in drive and bite. He can't. And so he doesn't. Then you get the dance suite, which he has no business doing in the world. There's nothing earthy or exciting about it. And the suite from the miraculous Mandarin. That's like Mariner conducting the Rite of Spring, something he should never, ever, 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 ever touch. Ever. I hope that's clear. Ever. But things go from bad to worse. You can't imagine what's going to happen next. Okay, look. Honegger, Symphony Number no. 3, the liturgique, that opening movement, that intense, biting, vicious, violent, turbulent, a Apocalypse, a tornado of sound, a volcanic, vicious, high energy, high voltage, electrifying. No, none of that. And because I can show you samples, we're going to hear just how wretched and awful it is. So here is the opening minute of that fabulous first movement from Honegger's Third, the Liturgique Symphony. Here's Mariner doing it. Thank you. 
Yes, that's it. That's what should happen. And want to hear a good one? Now let's do a good one. This is Serge Baudo with the Czech Philharmonic on Superfawn. Same music. You are not going to believe the difference. You aren't. Listen here. See what I mean? I mean, you know, the music speaks for itself, doesn't it? It's just horrible. And the other stuff that's on here is the Britain Sinfon Sinfonia da Requiem, equally dismal, and the Britain Sinfonietta number Opus 1, which nobody particularly cares about. Then we have, oh, you're not going to believe this, a Gershwin disc. An American in Paris, uh, Rhapsody in Blue, and the Concerto at F with Cecile Ousset. Poor Cecile. Such a lovely pianist. It's such a, a hopeless task. So let's forget about Gershwin. I mean, just the less said, the better. Then we get to CD 15, American Classics. You get the Porgy and Bess, the Porgy and Bess, uh, you know, that thing from Porgy and Bess. What is this, Porgy and Bess? Porgy and Bess, mel oh, melodies. It's some sort of, some sort of, potpourri thing. It's not the normal symphonic picture. It's just melodies somehow stitched together. Then Barber, Medea's Meditation and Dance of Vengeance. You know, Charles Munch did Medea's Meditation and Dance of Vengeance. This is Medea, you know, ordering takeout. That's what this is. Medea is doing drive through. There's no meditation and dance of vengeance here. And then we have, let's see, Copeland, El Sol in Mexico. Well, at least they can count. That's a good thing. And then Bernstein, Fancy Free, um, which sort of lacks a little swing to its rhythms. And West Side Story, Melodies. It's another potpourri thing. That's disc 15. And that, my friends, is the entire Stuttgart legacy, such as it is absolutely dire. It's horrendous. It's mostly horrendous anyway. And so like I said, as you saw here, when this is over, here you go. This is what you're going to feel like doing. I think that this new prop is going to be very, very useful in talking about some of the silly things that conductors do because there isn't anyone out there who can tell them not to, who can tell them that they simply suck, who can tell them that they have marvelous, splendid gifts. And Mariner did. He was a really talented guy. I mean, you, you, you can't give him enough credit for founding the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields, for restoring all of this wonderful Baroque and early classical music to the repertoire, for establishing such a high level of performance with his own chamber orchestra. But then it all went to his head. He got a scarf and all hell broke loose. And what can I tell you? It's my job. It's my job to say so. So there you go. Just, just appalling. 
absolutely appalling. Avoid this thing like death. Watch out for the scarf, folks. Just beware of the scarf. So keep on listening. Thank you for joining me. Take care.